won't miss anything. And Hi everyone, my name is Rob Canzanari. I'm the virtual chapter leader of the Data Architecture uh, virtual chapter for PASS. And I'm really pleased today to have Paul Randall. And he's going to come on and give a, um, a webinar on indexes. And I have a few slides here um, to share with you all from you know PASS. And some of the important things, if you want to get in touch with me, you're welcome to email me at rob at SQL Tigers, or you can visit my website, or you can go to PASS. I have everything on the PASS data architecture chapter there, too. So um, we're having, a, you know, PASS is having their big summit in 2015 in Seattle. And um, if, if you're going, please use this code uh, at the bottom in the red because it's going to save you $150. And um, if we get enough people, I think it's 10 people, use this code, I can raffle off a free session, which will be awesome. I would love to give a free session out to all the people watching. I mean, I think that'd be great. So um, please use it. And if we get enough people, use this code. I'm a, I'll be glad. We'll we'll pull a you know we'll pull one of the people out of the people attending and, and raffle it off and hopefully they can go if they can't we'll find someone you know we'll, we'll figure something out but we got to get it first so hopefully we'll get it um of course you know pass has lots of virtual chapters and here are some of them and um if you know they're all great and um they all have different topics and different sessions and you know please uh sign up if you like big data or whatever if you want to you know attend one here are some of the upcoming webinars and, uh, you know, execution plans, navigating paths, et cetera. They're all in the future coming up. So uh, if you want to go, just sign up and you can attend a session. Um, upcoming SQL Saturdays. Here are the ones this month and next month. We just, I went to the Baton Rouge one, actually presented this at the Baton Rouge on demystifying the transaction log. And uh, it was great. Got a lot of good feedback and I really enjoyed it. So learned a lot too. Got to meet a lot of really nice people, networked, and I learned um, a lot of topics. So I highly encourage if you're in Indianapolis or around these areas, uh, you know, sign up and go. And, and finally, this is my last screen. Um, if if you have someone or you know someone that volunteers a lot and does a lot of good stuff for PASS or just you know you think they you know they're very passionate about helping others. Um, you know, it could be anybody, it could be any virtual chapter, it could, you know, just please submit their name. I mean, it would mean a lot to them if um, they have an option to be a passion winner. You know, a lot of people, uh, uh, they just, uh, you know, just to get nominated, it's an honor. So, uh, okay. So with that, I'm going to switch the screen over to Paul. Uh, let's see if we get this rolling here. Okay. Paul, you're in charge. Okay. Are you you seeing my screen there? I not yet. It hasn't come over yet. Yeah. I I have the uh let me hmm. shut down that. See, let me try it again. Make sure it's No, it should be you. Hmm. I'm not seeing the thing to say share screen. You want me to take it and put it back or? Yeah, take it and put it back and. Okay, let's try that. Because it's not doing what it did before when we tested it. Sure. Okay. So I took it back. Now I'm going to put it back onto you. There you go. Here we are. So hopefully it went through. Can you see my screen? I just see the uh, login screen. Um, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. It's not. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't give me the. Hmm. I'm not seeing any other options on my side. It's got to be on yours. Hmm. On on the top of the go to webinar 
box. Do you see anything? Nope. No. no it's not saying. It's just saying webcams. Yeah. Um, let's see. Change. Sir. Yeah. Uh, I could drop out and come back in again. Yeah. Let's try that. Uh, when you All come right. back in, I'll I'll switch it back to you again. All right. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Are you there, Paul? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Let's try this now. Uh, I'm going to make you the presenter this time. Let's see if it works. Ah, I see your screen. Thank you. Rob, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hold on a second. I can't hear anything, so. Testing. Hold on a second. I'm just setting up my speakers for some reason when I connect it back. Okay, now I don't have any set. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to have to drop out again for some reason now. The webinar is not giving me any sound at all. Sure. I don't know if you can hear us. Go ahead. I can hear you, Paul. Can you hear me? Hello? second to reboot. Okay, sure.
So um, while we're waiting, um, Paul is uh, rebooting his PC. He's having a little technical difficulty. Uh, he can't. I don't think he can hear us, but I can hear him. And I think everyone, thank you for your chat windows uh, and questions, can hear him. Hopefully, uh, this issue will be resolved, and we can start the webinar uh, shortly. Hey, Rob, try speaking, Lee. I can hear you. Can you hear me? There we go. Now oh, I can. I don't. Good. So let me uh, make you the presenter now. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so I'm flipping it over to you. I see your screen, Paul. Can you hear me? There we go. Yep, I can. Oh, thank you. I don't know what went wrong there, but uh, okay. Everybody ready? Here we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about index fragmentation today, internals, analysis, and solutions. It's a, a great session that I've presented many times. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. Before we get into that, a couple of things about SQL skills. You probably know the, the list of people that, that work for us. There's a list up there. We do training, consulting, blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you're interested in our training, we have training events coming up through the rest of the year. We've got one in London, one in Dublin, and some more in Chicago in November. The link down at the bottom will give you all the information on our training stuff. And then me, so my name's Paul Randall. I used to work for Microsoft for a, a long number of years. I wrote all kinds of code in the storage engine, including the original DBCC index defrag and DBCC show contig, which is why I know a lot about stuff about fragmentation. Some, uh, some more interesting stuff, though, my email address. If you have any questions that you can't get answered during this session, because I'll stop every so often and Rob will read out any of the questions that we've got. If there's a question that you have that we, you don't get answered, send me an email, say you, you know, you're in the virtual chapter session, and I'll answer the question for you. And then our blog, as all of us at SQL Schools blog an awful lot, lots and lots and lots of free information. And then we're all on Twitter as well. Now, one thing I'd like to do for any user group, including the virtual chapters, is we have a lot of online courses through a company called Pluralsight. We have about 140 hours of online courses. If you're interested in a 30-day free trial, there's no, you don't have to give a credit card or anything like that, just a completely free trial, then uh, shoot me an email just saying user group plural site code and I'll send you back a, a code that you can use to, to watch all the, our stuff for 30 days. All right, enough of that. So index fragmentation. You cannot get away from index fragmentation. Okay? As soon as you start to have non-clustered indexes, you're going to have indexes that do not match your insertion pattern. And so by definition, the insertions into those indexes are going to be random and you're going to start to see fragmentation occur. So as far as data architecture is concerned and why this is important for this group of people is you need to design your systems knowing that fragmentation can happen because fragmentation can cause you big performance issues. So if you design the, the system to not have fragmentation or to take care of fragmentation using a thing called a fill factor, then you can avoid having performance issues when you put your application into production. So what we're going to cover today is how SQL Server uses basic index structures. We'll talk about the various kinds of fragmentation. We'll talk about how fragmentation happens, which is basically an operation called a page split. And we'll look at the ways that you can detect fragmentation, how you can mitigate it using fill factors, and how you can remove it if you do have it. So first off, a very basic index structure. So every access to an index starts at the root page. That's the, the R page there, okay, this one here. And then what happens is the storage engine is going to decide how to navigate down through the B tree to whatever leaf level page that has the key value on that you're interested in, depending on what the operation is that you're doing. So the index is, is linked together in a variety of different ways. There's top-down linkages, so from one level down to the next level down to the next level. And then there's left and right linkages here that we can see. And these are so that the storage engine can do ascending and descending ordered scans. Now, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a clustered index or a non-clustered index. This basic structure is the same. The only difference between clustered and non-clustered indexes, as far as we're concerned, is at the leaf level, this bottom level down here, the, the pages in a clustered index are data pages with data records. That, that is your table. And for a non-clustered index, they're index records on index pages which are a lot smaller. But the basic problems that we're going to talk about in terms of fragmentation are the same, whether we're talking about a clustered index or we're talking about a non-clustered index. So the first and the, the simplest 
use of an index structure is what's called a singleton lookup, where we're looking for a single row. So the access to the B tree starts at the root page, as we can see, and it's going to look in the records in the root page and determine, using the key values stored in these records, which way to navigate through the B tree to get to the record that we're interested in. So in this case, it's chosen to go down this left-hand branch. It looks at this intermediate level page, does the same thing, looks at the records that are there, and decides which way to navigate down to the leaf level. It decides to go this way and gets to this page here, and then it finds the record that we're interested in, given the search argument that you specified. Now, when it gets to this leaf level page, in fact, for all the pages that it's looking at, it's not going to do a, a, a brute force, read every single record until it comes to the, the key value that it's interested in. It does a thing called a binary search, and that's a much more efficient way of being able to find a particular value in a, an ordered list of things. And you can think of the records on a page as being ordered. And so it does, a, it does a binary search to make that as efficient as possible. So that's finding one record. And then finding multiple records, so doing some kind of, of range scan where we're looking for multiple records, where you've specified a starting and an ending predicate. So again, the access starts at the root page, and the storage engine figures out which way to navigate through the B tree to find the first matching record. So it finds the first matching record and it gives that record back to the query processor. Now, the interface between the query processor and the storage engine is one record at a time. So the, the query processor then says to the storage engine, okay, get me the next record. Now, the storage engine knows that it's doing a scan. So when it gives that first record back to the query processor, it doesn't drop its, or doesn't forget its position in the index. So for every record that it's giving back in the scan, it doesn't have to go all the way back up to the root page and navigate all the way down to the leaf level every single time. That would be very, very inefficient. What it does is it keeps a cookie, basically saying where I am in the leaf level of the index. And that cookie remains valid as long as nobody goes and changes the leaf level page that the scan is currently positioned on. If the, if the cookie becomes invalid, then the storage engine has to go and revalidate its position, starting at the, the root page and navigating down again. But if the cookie doesn't get invalidated, then the storage engine knows that that page hasn't changed at all, and so the next record in order must be the next record to give back in the scan. So it carries on giving the records back until it gets to the last record on that left-hand page there in purple. And so it gives the record back to the query processor. The query processor says, okay, get me the next record. The storage engine says, oh, no more records on this page. So it uses the, the linkages between the pages, saying, okay, I've, I've finished processing this page. It goes up into the page header, and in the page header, there's a next page pointer. In other words, what's the page that has the next set of key values on? And so it says to the buffer pool, please read me that next page into memory, which is this one. All right, so this page may or may not be in memory. If the page is already in memory, excellent. The processing continues. If the page isn't in memory, then the buffer pool has to do a physical I.O. to read the page into memory. And so the thread that's doing our scan has to wait for that I.O. to complete. Eventually, the page is going to be in memory, so it'll process all these records, ask for the next page, process all these records, ask for the next page, carry on processing records until it comes across a record that doesn't match the search predicates. And then it knows that it's finished doing its scan. So that's how a range scan works. Now, I didn't quite tell you the whole story there, because as we're going from page to page and doing these reads, what we'd really like to have happen is that when we say to the, store, to the buffer pool, read this page into memory, the buffer pool says, yep, already there, in which case it's an, it, nothing happens. It's called a logical I.O. The logical I.O. completes immediately, and the processing thread can just carry on processing. So what we'd really like is for all those pages that we're going to use at the leaf level to be already in the buffer pool. We'd like some way of pre-reading them into the buffer pool ahead of our scan point. So when a scan is happening, there is this process that's actually doing that, and it's reading these pages ahead of the scan point, and the process is called read ahead. And the way that works is, if you think of the way that a, uh, an index or B-tree structure is, these pages up here have a list of all of these pages down here in key order because right, that's how an index has to work. So by scanning this intermediate level up here, we can drive pre-reading these pages into memory ahead of our scan point. And so that makes our scans more efficient, because the scanning thread is not going to have to wait for IOs to actually complete. 
So read ahead is a pretty cool thing. Now, read ahead, right, it's there to make sure that the CPUs basically keep busy. And it does varying sizes of IOs, say one page, eight page, 32 page, and so on and so on. It's more efficient for it to do larger IOs. And it will do larger IOs as long as the pages that it's adding into its list of pages to read are in the same physical and logical order. In other words, the next page that we're looking at in the index leaf level should be the next physically contiguous page in the data file. If that doesn't happen, so in other words, if a page is out of order, then it has to drop off and do smaller IOs. It's obviously more efficient to do larger IOs. So we don't want it to have to drop off and do smaller IOs. So when we see pages that are out of order, those pages are called logically fragmented. So the thing that most people think about when they're talking about index fragmentation is this logical fragmentation, pages being out of order, causing scans to slow down because read ahead can't be as efficient as possible. So that's a very basic definition of what logical fragmentation does. And as I said, that's what most people think about when they're thinking about fragmentation. So the basic definition of logical fragmentation, and some people call that external fragmentation. There's all kinds of different names for the various kinds of fragmentation. I like to use what's in Books Online and how that talks about fragmentation because I wrote those Books Online pages. So it makes sense to just use those. I find the other terms confuse people. So logical fragmentation is when the next page at the leaf level of an index, the page that has the next key values on from the page we're coming from is not the next physically contiguous page. It's out of order in some way. And as I said, this can prevent read ahead from, from working. Now, obviously, read ahead doesn't really matter if the index is already completely in memory. And sometimes you'll find that small indexes are going to be completely in memory anyway. And you might also find that indexes that are very small, having some fragmentation in them isn't actually going to affect performance in a, in a noticeable way. And so I have this, this number that I came up with back in the 2000-2001 uh, the time frame where I said, if your index has less than 1,000 pages, don't bother about fragmentation because it's probably not going to make any, any difference. Nowadays, I might increase that number to anywhere from 1 to 5,000 pages. And this number came from the fact that people, Microsoft customers wanted some guidance about when to care about fragmentation. And as I was the person at Microsoft at the time, that's the guidance that I came up with. And also from seeing a lot of people posting on the old Usenet news groups, which to, to those of you that are young enough to not remember, those are, are kind of like the old, old forums you can think of. People would post saying, you know, I've just defragmented my index and I still have 45% fragmentation, help. And I would post a, a reply saying, well, how many pages are there in your index? And the answer would come back saying, four. And I'm like, dude, it doesn't matter, okay? Chill out. There's no need to get worried about fragmentation when your index is really, really small. So logical fragmentation you can look at as the average fragmentation in percent in the index physical stats DMV. Now, the other kind of fragmentation that most people don't think about is having low page density. And page density is, you can think of as, how much free space is there on the pages at the leaf level? And you want to have, basically, as little free space as possible, depending on the type of application that's using your index. Because the, the lower the page density is, in other words, the more free space there is on those leaf level pages, that means the fewer index rows there are on those pages, which means you're having to use more pages to store the same number of index rows, which means you're using more disk space, which means you have to do more IOs to actually read those pages in, and it also means you're taking up more space in memory, because an 8K page is still going to take up 8K in the buffer pool, even if there's only, say, a thousand bytes being used on it. So page density is another kind of fragmentation. And you can get page density using the average page space used in percent from the DMV. Now, as a little aside, there was a server that I did in my blog a couple of years ago now where I used the DMV, sys.dm OS buffer descriptors. And that link down there, that bitly link there, has, has all the code and stuff you can look at. And what I was doing was I, I sent out some code saying, run this code and, and give me back the results. And these are the results that I got back. And so what we have here is on the x-axis down here, we have a logarithmic scale in gigabytes of the number of gigabytes of memory currently in use for the buffer pool. So not just configured memory, but actually in use for the buffer pool. And then on the y-axis, we have what percentage of that memory is actually storing empty space. So that's an aggregate of the all of the empty space on all of the pages that are currently in the buffer pool. 
and there are some very interesting results. Now, around 30% or so, I'd say that's probably around normal. Okay, and we'll get to that when we start to talk about fill factors. But above 30%, this is where it becomes problematic. So let's look at a few of these outliers. Look at this one here. So this one here is, what is it, 62%, and on a logarithmic scale, it's probably around 200 gigabytes. So this is a 200 gigabyte buffer pool where 60% of that is, is free space, empty space, which means there's 200 gigabytes of data file pages in there, but there's an aggregate of, uh, what's 60% of 200? So 120 gigabytes of empty space. Okay, so that's a really, really poor use of the memory on that server. Now, it could be that the, the, the database is completely memory resident, and you're saying, well, there's no IOs. But I would still say, well, we're 60% free space on average. That means that at most pages are only 40% full. So you're having to do lots of page-to-page -page transitions in the code inside the storage engine, which you're still wasting performance. Even if you say, well, I'm not having to do any IOs, you're still burning a whole bunch of extra CPU cycles executing code that you wouldn't have had to execute quite so many times. So this is a really poor use of that memory. And then let's look at these guys over here. So these are, what, 10 gig, just under 10 gig buffer pools, so very small servers anyway, but almost 100% of the buffer pool space is taken up by empty space, and that's a chronic fragmentation problem. So if you don't take anything else away from this session, okay, go back and look at this code here at this bit.ly link, go run it, and have a look and see what kind of free space you have in your buffer pool. And you might be really surprised, and this could be a reason why your server is driving an awful lot of uh, read I.O. to your I.O. subsystem because you've got big fragmentation issues that means that your buffer pool can't make very efficient use of the space that it has. So Rob, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Um, we're doing great. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now, so we're good oh. to go. All right, we'll carry on. So fragmentation is basically caused by a thing called a page split. Right? This is the most common cause of fragmentation. And a page split occurs when a record has to be inserted on a page because with an index, the storage engine has no choice about where to put a new record or where to expand a record. The record's position in the index is dictated by the key value of the record. So if a, uh, an index leaf level page is full and a new record comes in and it has to go on that page, the storage engine has no, no choice. It has to make space on the page for that record. And if there isn't enough space on the page, the page will split. Okay. The other thing could be if a record is made longer. So maybe you've got a, an index that has a variable length column in it, and the variable length column is updated to be longer than it was before. If there isn't enough space for that updated record, the, record, the page is going to have to split. And it could be something uh, as innocuous, you might think, as enabling snapshot isolation, like read committed snapshot isolation. Whenever you enable read committed snapshot isolation, any time a record is, is changed, the, the record is changed, but then the new version of the record has a 14-byte versioning tag added onto the end, which means the record has expanded by 14 bytes. If there's no space on the page where that record lives, a page split will have to occur. So just doing something like enabling snapshot isolation can cause page splits, can cause fragmentation. Even in an index where you're not actually making the record longer yourself, you might be just updating a, an integer column, which you wouldn't think would change the size of the record. But because you've got snapshot isolation, the record grows by 14 bytes. And the other thing is if you're using a readable secondary, then when you enable the readable secondary on the availability group, it's going to change everything under the covers to be snapshot isolation. And it's going to have to add the 14-byte tags on the primary database, even though you're not actually using snapshot isolation on the primary database. So that's going to cause page splits to start to occur and fragmentation to start to occur on the primary database in your availability group just because you enabled readable secondaries on your availability group. Okay. So page splits are, are generally going to be around 50-50. It's basically going to copy half the rows to another page to make space on the, the page that we're interested in. So as an example, imagine that we're going to insert a record into this index, and we're going to insert a record into this page, page B. But page B is completely full. Right? And we have no choice where that record goes. Again, it's because the index key value says it has to go on page B. So to do this page split, what it's going to do is it's going to allocate another page, and we'll, we'll call it B1. 
Now, the odds of page B1 being able to be physically contiguous to page B are almost zero. So page B1 is, is out of order. It's logically fragmented. So page B1 gets half the rows copied onto it. It then has to get linked into the B tree. So it has to get linked to point back to page B. So page B's page header has to change. But also, it's been inserted essentially logically in between B and C. So page C's page header has to change to point back to page B1. Now, page C is now no longer the next physically contiguous page from the previous logical page. So page C is also now logically fragmented. So we've created two logically fragmented pages here, B1 and C. And then page B1 has to get linked into the B tree. So it has to get a row added in in page P pointing down to it. So if page P is full, then that might split as well. And so you might get a what's called a cascading split all the way up to the root page of an index, right? which can be very expensive because all of this is done completely logged. It's fully logged no matter what recovery model you're in. And it's done as a, a special thing called a system transaction. So if you've got lots of fragmentation happening, then you're generating a lot of extra transaction log, which can cause performance issues. Now, looking at these page splits, it can be difficult to figure out when page splits are occurring. So there's two different kinds of page splits. There's the ones that we've just been talking about, which I call nasty page splits. But there's also what are called good page splits, where if you've just got an insert, a append-only insert pattern, where you're adding records to the end of an index, like you've got a big identity column, for instance, in your table, and that's your cluster key, then you're going to be filling up a page, adding another page, filling up the page, adding another page. You're not actually causing what I've just called as a nasty page split, but that action of adding that extra page at the end of the index, the access methods portion of the storage engine calls that a page split. So all of your documented methods of tracking page splits right, track good and nasty page splits and don't differentiate between them. So the access methods page splits per second perfmon counter tracks both the um, leaf count, I think it's called, column in the DB index operational stats, D DMV, counts both. The extended event counts both. Even the, the, the new version of the extended event in 2012 onwards, which gives you a reason for the page split happening, you can't definitively say whether it was a good or nasty page split using that extended event without going and doing some post-processing and looking at the page itself. So there is one method you can use, which is you can look in um, 2012 onwards, there's an extended event called transaction log. And there's a special log record that is only generated when a nasty page split occurs. It's called an LOP delete split. And you can look for that using the 2012 extended event for transaction log. So that is a definitive way of seeing page splits happening, either in real time using extended events or after the fact using the FNDB log or FN dump DB log on documented table valued functions to scan through the transaction log or log backups looking for that particular log record. And if you go to that bit.ly link there, then you can see an example of how you would go, go ahead and do that. So let's have a, uh, a little demo of looking at how expensive page splits can be. How are we doing? Any questions so far? Um, all we have really, and I'll just shout this out, uh, the session is recorded, and we're going to post it on the Data Architecture chapter on PASS, or you can go to my website. That's it. Go ahead. Okay. And maybe Rob will edit it to, uh, to take out the first 10 minutes where we couldn't get the webinar to work. I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> all right. So what we've got here is um, I'm going to create a little database, and I'm running all my demos on uh, 2014. I've got a little database that I'm going to create called Page Split Test. Very simple demo. And then what I'm going to do is... I'm going to create a table with roughly 1,000 byte rows. And I'm just, I'm just padding that with a char 1,000 to make it roughly 1,000 bytes. And then I'm going to create a scenario where I've got a bunch of rows on a page, and I've got enough space on the page to be able to insert one more row without a page split occurring. But then if I try to insert a second row, it's going to cause a page split. And we're going to be able to compare how much transaction log is generated between the two scenarios. So the first one, I'm going to go ahead and insert my row that won't cause a page split. And then I can use this DMV, DMTran Database Transactions, scoped down to just my database and have a look and see how much transaction log that insert took. So the insert without the, the page split there, for a 1,000 byte row roughly, 1,256 bytes. And if you run this code on, because I'm going to give Rob the code to post as well, if you run this code on different 
earlier versions of SQL Server, you will see slightly different values because the log records have changed size from version to version. So on my version, 1256 bytes, and now if I do the page split, 1256 bytes versus 7580 bytes. So five to six times more transaction log because we had to do a page split because we got fragmentation there. So now let's go down to roughly 100 byte rows instead. So we'll get rid of our big rows table, go down to medium rows. And the same thing, space for one row but not enough space for two. And then with no page split, the insert takes 356 bytes, and then with the page split, it takes 6,772 bytes. So what's that, 18 to 20 times more transaction log? So obviously as the, the row size gets smaller, the, the, the amount more transaction log that's generated increases. Okay? So you want to really take care of fragmentation. And then let's go down to roughly 10 byte rows. And I'm going to create a scenario where it's going to do what's called a skewed page split. It's not going to do a 50-50 page split. It's going to figure out that it should split the, the page at the, the boundary point between a couple of different sets of rows rather than just 50-50. So I'm going to create this scenario. And then my insert without a page split, 268 bytes. And then my insert with the page split, 11,172 bytes. So that's what, 40 to 45 times more transaction log. So a very simple demo there showing just how, how much more transaction log a page split can cause. And if you think about it, the, when a page split occurs, all that transaction log is generated. It's all going to have to be backed up and restored. It all has to be sent to your log shipping secondaries, sent across the wire to your database mirrors, your availability group secondaries, scanned by replication, scanned by change data capture, and so on and so on and so on. So having a lot of fragmentation occurring can cause a huge amount of extra transaction log to be generated. Right? And this is one of the things that many people who try to mitigate fragmentation or just say you don't have to care about fragmentation don't think about is the amount of, fra the amount of transaction log that's generated. Now sometimes people will say, well, if you're using SSDs, solid state disks, you can ignore fragmentation. And it's complete nonsense. Okay? There's been plenty of blog posts showing that SSDs, although they make IOs faster, you still are slower when you've got fragmentation. And SSDs, even though they speed up your IOs, do nothing to stop page splits occurring. So it's still generating all this transaction log. You've still got all the logging issues that you would have had. And furthermore, if you're ignoring fragmentation on your SSDs, you're going to have a bunch of pages that have low page density, which means you're not making very good use of your expensive SSDs. Right? So you can't ignore fragmentation. No matter what scenario you've got, what hardware you've got, you still have to take care of fragmentation. So that's the end of that little demo there. Any questions on that demo? Um, yeah, um, we did get a few questions, but it, it's about your link. Some people are the bit LY10QS55H link you showed. They tried it, and they're having some issues. They're saying it's not working. So um, This one? That looks like the one they're referencing, yes. Let me see. Works for me. Okay. Uh, so what you're, what you're doing, time. just make sure that, uh, oh, it's going to be this. It's, it's a zero and not a, sorry, it's a zero, not a capital O. So anytime you're seeing any bit.ly links, if it's something that a, a looks like a, a one or a capital L, just try the different combinations. Okay. Let's so this see. one here. Let me just put it into, into Notepad. It's uh, a 1 and a 0. Okay. And then oh, your bit uh, will work. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll paste it in the chat. Uh, they're asking okay. for me to do that. I'll take care of that in a second. All right. No and worries, um, let's see. Scanning through here. Lots of. It's all about the link. So uh, I think we're good. Oh, wait, wait. Okay. Here's one. Here's one. I, I overlooked it. I apologize. Uh, so. Read ahead is a good thing. Can it be? It, can it be disabled? If yes, why and should it ever be disabled? Uh, the answer is no. You can't disable it. Okay, thank so you. That, that, that's simple. There's no reason to disable to, to disable read ahead. Um, it would just make scans go slower because the pages wouldn't be there, and it, it's not like read ahead is going to be causing any kind of problem with your I/O subsystem or with your buffer pool. It's a good thing, and that's why you you can't turn it off. 
All right, so we were here, so let's go to here. So causes of fragmentation. The, obviously, if you have some kind of table schema or index schema that's going to cause page splits, and the, 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 the most common schema for causing page splits is one that has some kind of random key value. And in that set, the most common one is somebody's chosen to use a random GUID as a cluster key. Very common to see this happen, even with, especially with um, third-party products that you might download or, and use, or even Microsoft products like SharePoint uses GUIDs as cluster keys all over the place, and so you get lots of fragmentation issues with SharePoint. So e even a, a GUID on a clustered index can cause problems with non-clustered indexes as well, and I'll show you that when we do our next demo. So any kind of random key value where the insert isn't an append-only insert pattern is going to cause fragmentation. So again, as soon as you have non-clustered indexes that have index keys that aren't the same as your cluster key, then you're going to start to have fragmentation because the inserts into those non-clustered indexes are essentially random. Um, updates to variable length columns, any, any time, anything basically that's going to make a row larger than it already is can cause fragmentation by causing page splits. And then not having a fill factor configured or having your fill factor configured incorrectly. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So the, if you're trying to avoid fragmentation, you're going to be looking at using fill factors. You might also be able to change your clustered index key or design your clustered index so that it doesn't have a random key. It can be very hard to change a clustered index key after the fact. It is possible to do it, but it can be very hard to do. But if you can design up front your clustered index to not have a random key, then you're not going to have to mess around with fill factors uh, on your clustered index. And the clustered index is generally going to be the largest entity, let's say, that you're going to have to remove fragmentation for. So it makes sense, if you can, to design your clustered index not to have a key that's going to cause fragmentation. And then if you think about fragmentation as also being low page density, then a very wide schema can cause fragmentation issues. For instance, maybe you've got a fixed size 5,000 byte table record. You're only going to be able to get one of those per page. So you're going to be wasting 3,000 bytes per page in your clustered index. Okay? So a very wide schema can cause, can cause page density issues. And then even a delete operation can cause fragmentation if you think about page density as a fragmentation issue. Because if you have a, a clustered index with a, a nice big identity column, you have an append-only insert pattern, and then you, do, you go back and you do, do deletes of earlier records, then no insert is ever going to go and use that earlier space because you've got an append-only insert pattern. And so you might have slowly degenerating page density problems in the earlier portions of your clustered index. Now, I, I've said several times a big identity column. If you are thinking about using a big identity column or an int identity column, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to have not going to have performance issues. Right? You might have a very small row size in your table. And if you have an identity column and lots and lots of concurrent inserters with a small row size, you might end up with what's called an insert hotspot in your index, where you've got latch contention, different thing that we're talking about in this session, latch contention on the the insert point. Now, Rob, do you remember the, the one that I did earlier this year? Was it on weight stats? I think it was, wasn't it? It was yes. on weight statistics. Perfect. Okay, so... So the stuff I've just been talking about, the insert hotspot and the, the latch contention, I talked about that in the, the data architecture VC session that I did, I think it was back in January or February. So go back onto the webpage and look for the earlier session that I did this year, and you'll be able to see a demo about the insert hotspot. So you've got to be careful when you're, you're juggling what to do with your clustered index key because you know if you use a random key you might have fragmentation issues if you use a non-random append only insert pattern you might end up with an insert hotspot and the insert hotspot you can only solve by going back to a more random key so you might be forced to use a random key and use a fill factor instead so anytime you're you're designing a new system just make sure that you test under load to make sure that you're not going to hit an insert hotspot problem because you've designed out fragmentation Okay. It could be that you might have to just live with the fragmentation and work around it using a fill factor rather than a different key, key schema. So talking about fill factor, fill factor is a thing you can use to mitigate fragmentation. And the way that it works is when an index is being created or rebuilt, 
the storage engine takes into account the fill factor that you've specified and leaves some free space at the leaf level of the index. And the way that you'd set it, for instance, if you wanted to leave 30% free space, you'd set your fill factor to 70. Okay. So it's basically the amount of free space that it leaves is 100 minus the fill factor that you've set. Okay. So don't think of it the opposite way around and, uh, and, and get confused. Don't set your fill factor to 30 because that's going to leave 70% free space. So this fill factor is only used when the index is created or rebuilt, not when it regular inserts, updates, and deletes are happening. Because what you're doing with the fill factor is you're saying periodically you're rebuilding your index and you're giving a, an amount of free space on all of your leaf level pages so that there is enough free space to allow rows to expand, to allow, allow new rows to be inserted without filling the page up and causing a page split. So you decide on your fill factor and then periodically you have to go and rebuild or reorganize your index to put that fill factor amount of space back again. So you're, you're, you're basically doing a, a kind of stop gap where you, you're preventing fragmentation from happening for a little bit of time, but then you're eventually going to run out of space and it's going to start to do page splits. So this is why periodically you have to go back and rebuild or reorganize to put that amount of free space back again. Now, what fill factor number do you choose? If, you're, if you don't have any inserts happening that are going to cause fragmentation, if you don't have any updates happening that are going to cause fragmentation, leave it alone at 0, 100. Okay. Don't go setting the instance level fill factor, leave it alone. Set the fill factor per index for those indexes that need it only. Okay, that's the easiest way. Now for an OLTP system where you've got fragmentation that's happening, what number do you choose? And there isn't a right answer to that. There is no right answer. There's no one-size-fits-all answer. What I always tell people to do is, for those indexes where you've got fragmentation, pick a number initially, put it in production, and monitor your fragmentation, and see how quickly the, the fragmentation starts to occur. And then you can tweak your fill factor up or down, or tweak how often you're doing something to reset the fill factor, like a rebuild or a reorganize. And the number that most people pick as the, the starting number when they're going through this process is 70. In other words, leave 30% free space, which is why if you think back to the, the page density survey data picture that I showed you, I drew the line across 30% and said 30% or lower free space, that's probably around normal. That's because many people use 70 as a fill factor for their indexes. Now, if you're going to find out how much fragmentation you've got, the easiest way to do it is to use the DMV that does this, Index Physical Stats. And that replaced the, the old DBCC show contig that I wrote for SQL Server 2000. And it's a much better, it's a much easier thing to use than show contig because, because it's a DMV. It's nice and composable. It's a table-valued function. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. Now, there's three different modes of running the DMV, okay? limited, sampled, and detailed. And I'll skip to the next slide and then I'll come back again. So the limited mode is the fastest way of running the DMV. And that's because it doesn't look at the leaf level at all. It looks at the intermediate level, the level in purple there. And it uses the same trick that Read Ahead does, where that level in purple has a list of all the pages at the leaf level of the index in index order, in, in key order. So it can look at those page IDs and it can determine determine the fragmentation level of the leaf level just using that list of page IDs. So it's a very efficient way of being able to see what your logical fragmentation is. Now, because it's not reading the leaf level in the limited mode, you don't get the page density because you can only get that from actually looking at the leaf level. So going back to the previous slide, the limited mode is the, is the default. So that's the one that, that you generally want to be using if you're just looking for a, a, a page count and the fragmentation level. Now, down at the bottom there, the detailed mode, if you want to know everything about everything, the detailed mode is the one to use. That's going to read, it's going to do a limited mode scan first to give you the logical fragmentation, and then it's going to read all the pages at the leaf level to give you all of the statistics about that particular index. And I don't want to use the word statistics because that might confuse people. Let's say metrics instead, all the metrics about the leaf level. Then if you have a very large index, but you want to get an idea of what the, the metrics are for the leaf level, but you don't want to go to the expense of using the detailed mode, you can use the sampled mode. And what the sampled mode does is it says, I'm going to read every 100th leaf level page, and then, and then just multiply by 100 to, to, to give you a, an idea of what the, the leaf level metrics are. Now, there's all kinds of bits of information in the DMV. 
and in fact, when we when I wrote the DMV, there was a bunch of different metrics that the old DBCC show contig used to give information about fragmentation. There was logical scan fragmentation, extent scan fragmentation, extent switches, scan density, and people get confused about what they should look at. So we decided to remove a bunch of the the metrics that you were told, and we decided to try and be clever and invent a new set of metrics called fragments and average fragment size, and uh, have people look at those to determine what the fragmentation is. And uh, I believe we failed miserably because I think they're just as, as complicated for people to understand from what I've heard from people as the old methods of looking at fragmentation. So I'd like you to ignore those and just look at the logical fragmentation, the page density, and the number of pages you have in your index. Okay, and those are the, the three very simple things that you can look at. So let's have a, a little look at using the DMV. So what I've done here is I've got a, a script that I've already ran. It takes about 30 seconds to run, and it'll take anywhere from 30 seconds to a few minutes to run on, on your machines, depending on how powerful your machine is. And what it does is it creates two tables in a, a database called GUID test, and one of them is called bad key table, the second one's called better key table. Right? And the bad key table has a clustered index on column C1, and C1 is a random GUID. Okay. It also has a non-clustered index on C2, and C2 is a datetime column. And then better key table has exactly the same schema. The only difference is that C1 is a sequential GUID rather than being a random GUID. Okay. And then I go ahead and stick in a quarter million rows into each of those. So now, our examine fragmentation. So we're going to look at the DMV, but I'm also going to use extended events to show you just how expensive each of the options in the DMV can be. So first off, I'm just going to go out and get rid of any old results files that I may have had with extended events. And, and you, some of you might panic and say, oh, well, my goodness, you have to use XP command shell for extended events. No, you don't. I was just using it to go out and do a, a delete operation on my file system there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a very simple extended events session so whenever a SQL statement completed event fires, which gives you the number of IOs that were done and the length of time something took, I'm also going to grab the SQL text so I can see which of my, my different options of running the DMV I was using. Now I'm running this on 2014, but I'm using the old syntax for using an extended event because the old syntax works for all versions of SQL Server. And I want to make sure that you can run this code all the way back to SQL Server 2008. So I'm going to go ahead and create my extended event session there, and then start my event session up. And I'm going to run a detailed, a sampled, and a limited mode of the DMV, and then I'll stop my event session. So my three different runs of the, the DMV. The first one up here, this is the detailed one. And you can see the DMV gives you object IDs and index IDs, and I'm sure you don't have your object IDs memorized. So you're going to have to do a, a cross-apply with something like sys.indexes to get the name of your tables and indexes. And a cross-apply because it's a table valid function, so you can't join to it. And then the detailed mode is going to give you, for each of your indexes, so this is, let's look at our first clustered index here. This is a clustered index for the bad key table. It's going to give one row for each of the levels in the index. Okay, so the leaf level is always level zero, going up to the root page, and you can see that our root page only has one page here. Where's the page count? The page count is here, one page. So you can see this is kind of an inverted B tree here with a number of pages. So I'm not going to go through absolutely everything. It, it's, it's telling us what type of allocation unit it's looking at, whether it's just the, the regular records, whether it's lob data or something like that. It tells us the average fragmentation in percent. It's telling us the page count and it's telling us the page density. Now, for our purposes, we're not interested in anything else in this output. Now, for a sampled mode, it gives one row for each leaf level of the index, and it's just gone and sampled every 100th page, figured the metrics out, multiplied by 100. Okay. And what we're interested in down here is the leaf level, uh, sorry, the, the limited mode. And the limited mode, again, gives one row per, per leaf level. And it gives us the average fragmentation in percent, it gives us the page count, but then it can't give us the page density or anything else that it would determine from the leaf level because it didn't read the leaf level. But many people just use the logical fragmentation 
and the page count to determine whether to do anything about fragmentation. And so the limited mode gives you all that information. Now, if we look at how expensive each of those was, okay, I'm going to extract that information out from the extended events session. Now, there are two bits of code here. If you're on 2012, 2014, or 2016, you want to use the first piece of code. If you're 2008 or 2008 R2, you want to use the this piece of code here. That's because the extended events are XML, and the XML changed from 2008 R2 to 2012. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. We can see there, this is the, our detailed mode, our sampled mode, and our limited mode. And we can see in terms of the number of reads that were done, Right, so you might say, well, the table was only 20,000, so why is it showing 40,000 here? That's because it was reading both tables, and they were both around 20,000. So it shows how many reads were done and duration of milliseconds. So obviously we can see that the limited mode is by far the cheapest option for figuring out what your fragmentation is. And so that's what I recommend. Always use the limited mode for figuring out your fragmentation, unless you want to know the page density as well. Right. Now, going back to looking at our actual fragmentation, I've got this little script here, which is going to give us all the information in a little bit more of a human digestible form. So here's the fragmentation that we have. So our bad key table, the clustered index, is almost 100% fragmented. That's what we would expect. And the better key table clustered index, less than 1% fragmented, because we're using a sequential GUID. So a sequential key value, basically, rather than a random key value. Now, our non-clustered index on the sequential GUID uh, table, less than 1% fragmented, but on our random GUID cluster key table, our non-clustered in index here has 28% fragmentation. Now that can only be because we've had random inserts happening, and we have had random inserts. So we go back to the schema of our table. So our bad key table here, the C2 column is a date time, and at date time, the minimum time period that can resolve is 3.3 milliseconds. So if I can insert many hundreds of records every 3.3 milliseconds, which my laptop can, then all of those non-clustered index records, because I didn't create a unique non-clustered index, they all have the same C2 value. Now the actual cluster, sorry, the actual non-clustered index key for this index is C2, and then under the covers, comma C1. And that's what serves to create the uniqueness of this non-clustered index. So if I've got many hundreds of C2 values all the same, the insertion point into that range becomes determined by the next most significant key, which is C1. And if C1 is a random key value, that means I've got a bunch of random inserts into that range of the non-clustered index. And that's why I end up with page splits occurring, creating fragmentation in my non-clustered index. So a, a random cluster key value can also bleed over into non-clustered indexes and cause problems there as well. So any questions so far, Rob? Yeah, we do have a few. Um, I'm going to kind of look at them with you. Um, let's see. What is the impact of, a, of the include clause covering index on fragmentation? There is no impact whatsoever because the – well, okay, let me, let me clarify. Uh, my first reaction is there's no impact at all, okay, because the the included keys are not part of the, sorry, the included columns are not part of the index key. However, if one of the included columns is a variable length column and you change the variable length value to be longer, then that's going to increase the non-clustered index column size, which could lead to fragmentation occurring. Okay? But on in general, there, it's not going to cause problems. Okay. Yep. That makes sense to me. Um, so here's one about the free space. Um, isn't the leftover empty space a waste when it's 30% free? Yes. So what you're doing is you're doing a trade-off where you're saying, I want to I want to proactively provide free space for these pages, so that when free space is required for records expanding or records being inserted, a page split doesn't have to happen. So what you're saying is the trade-off you're making is page splits are much more expensive and more detrimental to the performance of my system than having some extra free space. And for the vast majority of, of systems, that is true. 
So you're making a, a, a good trade-off. I'm sure there is a pathological case that somebody can come up with that shows that that is a, a bad thing, but I've never ever seen a problem where the, the amount of free space you're giving for your fill factor is a bigger problem than the page splits that you're having from not having a fill factor in those systems. Wow, that, that actually answered one of my questions in my mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what do you think about having a, oh, let me restate this. What do you think about high fill factors versus empty pages in the buffer pool? And I think you already answered that. High fill factors versus empty pages. Um, I, I'd, I'd much rather have pages with a fill factor on preventing page splits from occurring. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the question is because it, it doesn't quite make sense to me. Okay. But, but, but yeah, I'd, I'd rather proactively have free space and not have uh, large amounts, larger amounts of free space and all the extra logging from page splits occurring. I think that's what the question is getting at. All right. Let's see. So I guess what, the way I'm reading this question, it's a little fuzzy on me, is, is it says fragmentation impact worse on clustered versus non-clustered indexes. And I think they're trying to see which is worse. Um, it's, it's hard to say which is worse. Because because you're getting you're getting page splits occurring in both cases. You're going to have extra logging occurring in both cases. It's not like it's going to generate more transaction log to do a page split of a clustered index versus a non-clustered index. What you have to to think about is if you want to remove the fragmentation, the clustered index is going to be a a larger entity to remove fragmentation on, just because there you've got all. all the larger rows, you've got more pages generally in your clustered index. So you're going to be generating more transaction log, for instance, to rebuild it versus rebuilding a non-clustered index. I, I think that hopefully answers that question. Okay. I'll give you one more and we okay. can move on if you like. Um, do clustered index can contain the clustered key or a RID pointer to the row in the clustered index? Do... I think it meant to be, I think the person meant to say the non-clustered indexes. Oh, um, I read that. No, do non-clustered. Yeah, I read that wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, right. So every non-clustered index record has a, essentially a, you can think of it as a pointer to the matching base table record, whether that base table is a clustered index or a, a heap. If the base table is a clustered index, then the pointer is the cluster keys, because that guarantees uniqueness. If the base table is a heap, then the pointer is a physical pointer with the, the file ID, the page ID, and the slot number on the page. But every non-clustered index record absolutely has to have a pointer back to the, the base table record from which it is derived. Okay. Um, here's one about SharePoint databases. It, it, it says, for SharePoint databases, page splits always happen. I've set the fill factor to 85%. Is it possible to get a higher average fragmentation in percent? Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I read two questions at once. Let me. Okay. Uh, I, it's hard to see the lines. No, but that's He's uh, saying um, he's having a lot of page splits in his SharePoint database, and he set this fill factor to 85%. So um, set your fill factor lower. If you're if you're still seeing page splits and you want to get rid of the page splits, reduce your fill factor. Okay, because that that's the trade-off. That's the only trade-off you can make is lower fill factor to reduce the number of page splits. And then you're going to have to you're going to have to rebuild your rebuild or reorganize your indexes as well in the SharePoint database to either, depending on which version you're on, maybe, whether, maybe you're using one of their timer jobs or you're doing it yourself, but it's the same as any other database. And uh, SharePoint's a particularly bad example because the schema that SharePoint uses is absolutely abysmal for causing fragmentation. So you're just gonna have to bite the bullet and reduce your, reduce your fill factor. If you're finding that these page splits and the fragmentation is causing you performance issues in your SharePoint farm. Okay. We can go on and, and circle back later if you want. Okay, let's uh, just in case anybody has to you know curtail their lunch hour, let's go on and, and uh, finish the presentation off, and then I'll take a bunch of questions at the end. Okay. All right. So back to the slides. So correcting fragmentation. 
you've got two realistic choices for correcting fragmentation. So you've already got a fill factor maybe there, or, or maybe you don't have a fill factor, and you've had a lot of page splits, and you see that you've got some fragmentation. You can either rebuild the index in its entirety, or reorganize the index, which does a, a much more targeted, but potentially slower, removal of fragmentation that exists. Now there's another option you can use, which is essentially the same as a rebuild, and that's to do a create index operation, where you say with drop existing equals on. In other words, rebuild the index. But you're only going to you only want to want to use the create index statement if you want to change something about the index, because you have to specify the entire index create statement. And if you're just going to do a rebuild, then why go to all the hassle of doing that? Just do a rebuild. Now the other thing you could do is not remove fragmentation. You might see, well, I've got fragmentation there, but it's not causing me any performance issues, so you could just not bother. Okay, that's your choice. Now, the other thing you, you generally don't want to do is have a, a sledgehammer approach where you have a rebuild job that rebuilds every index on every table and every database every single day. Because you're going to find that some of your indexes aren't going to have fragmentation, and that rebuild everything every day is going to be overkill. It could be, though, that you have a system where there's no DBA and you want to make sure that there's no fragmentation and you decide that I've, I don't care about the, the all the extra transaction log it generates to do all those rebuilds, I'm just going to go ahead and do the sledgehammer approach. If that is you and that works for you and your scenario, fine. But in general, I don't recommend doing that. I recommend a much more piecemeal approach and only targeting those indexes that actually have fragmentation. Now, right down at the bottom of that slide, you might find if you're using database mirroring or an availability group that you can't do a rebuild because an index rebuild, if you're in the full recovery model, is going to generate almost as much transaction log as the size of the index. And if you're using database mirroring or an availability group, you have to use the full recovery model. And so it might not be possible for you to rebuild your large indexes. So in that case, you might be forced to use an alter index reorganize instead. And you can do a thing called staggered index maintenance. If you just go to Google or Bing and look for staggered index maintenance, you'll come across a, a blog post, I think on my, the, my old SQL Mag blog, that talks about how to do that. So comparing a contrasting rebuild versus reorganize, just quickly go through this list. So rebuild is an atomic operation. That's a good thing and a bad thing. because It's a good thing because when it finishes, you know you've got a new index that hopefully has less fragmentation than you had before. It's a bad thing because if you don't let it finish, you get nothing. Okay, there's no partial index rebuild. If you stop it 99% of the way through, it rolls back everything that it did. Okay. You don't have to know anything at all about the, and that's different from a re reorganized, I should say, because a reorganized, you can stop at any point and it doesn't roll back anything. Both a rebuild and a reorganized, you don't have to know anything at all about the index that you're rebuilding. You just have to know its name. Now, for a rebuild, you can, it will use multiple CPUs in Enterprise Edition, and you can also control how many CPUs it uses as well, so it doesn't go and use all the CPUs on your, you know, 80-core server. Uh, a rebuild is parallelizable then, but a reorganize is always single-threaded. Okay. Now, an index rebuild is going to rebuild the index column statistics with the equivalent of a full scan, because it sees the entire index. It doesn't touch the non-index column statistics. Now, an index reorganized doesn't touch statistics at all. So if you're combining index and statistics maintenance, then you need to know which one of those two you did for your index, and that's going to determine what else you have to do in terms of statistics maintenance. You can rebuild a single partition of an index, or you can do all partitions of the index. Now, in terms of online index rebuild, you can't online index rebuild a single partition until 2014. Okay. You can't online rebuild an index that has a, a lob column until 2012. If you have a table that has a lob column, like a varchar max, if you're, you can't online index rebuild the clustered index until 2012. Because okay, under the covers, is an architectural limitation. Even though you can't have a lob column as an index key, the fact that it's there in the table means your clustered index cannot have online index operations done on them until 2012. For some indexes, if you do a rebuild, it might not have to sort the data. It might read the old index to build the new one. So it uses a little bit less space in the, in the database to not have to do the, the, the sort that it builds the index from. And then if you're able to use the bulk logged recovery model, then the index rebuild operation can be what's called minimally logged in that it doesn't generate quite so much transaction log. It doesn't change the size of your subsequent log backup but it means that the transaction log itself doesn't have to be quite as large to have all the index rebuild log records in. 
and index reorganize can only ever be done um, fully logged, no matter what recovery model you're in. All right. Now, going down to the cons, we already talked about the atomic operation. In terms of space, it has to build a new index before it drops the old one. So you need to have enough free space in your database to create the new index structure before it drops the old one. And that can be impossible for some of you if you have like a terabyte index you're trying to, trying to rebuild. Now, I would say that if you have a terabyte index that is not partitioned, you already have other problems. You should be partitioning database, sorry, data that size and doing per partition operations. Right? And if you're trying to do an offline index rebuild, so if you don't have enterprise edition and you're forced to use a, uh, an offline rebuild, the table is completely locked. It's called a schema modification lock. You can think of it as a, a super exclusive lock. The table is completely locked for the entirety of the rebuild, whether it's a clustered or non-clustered index that's being rebuilt. Now for a reorganize, reorganize is always online. Now a lot of the, 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 the uh, problems that we just talked about with the rebuild, the reason that I originally wrote DBCC index defrag for SQL Server 2000 was as a, a low space online, in some cases faster alternative to doing a DBCC DB reindex. So a reorganize is always online. Okay? It doesn't take any blocking locks. You can stop it straight away. It's going to stop instantly. It's not going to roll anything back. It's going to do progress reporting for you in the DM exec request DMV. It's going to compact off-row lob data by default, okay, if you have any of that. Now, for a lightly fragmented index, it's going to be faster than a rebuild because it only deals with the fragmentation that exists. Now, on the, the flip side of that, if you've got a very heavily fragmented index, it's probably going to be faster doing a rebuild than doing a reorganize. Now, reorganize can always online reorganize one of the partitions since since uh, 2005, uh, or you can just do all partitions, and it doesn't need any extra disk space. It just requires one extra data file page. So you could say it needs 8K of data of, of space, whereas a rebuild requires how big is your index amount of space. Okay. Now, on the con side, if you've got a heavily fragmented index, it's going to get bogged down, and it's always fully logged. It's only ever single-threaded, and it doesn't touch your statistics. So trade-offs, you've got pros and cons. Right? And so your comparison points, you're going to have to choose what you're going to do in terms of a rebuild versus a reorganize based on you know, how much space you've got, how much log is going to get generated, how much fragmentation there is, whether you need it to be online or not, whether you want to be able to interrupt it or not, doing like staggered index maintenance, or whether you want to be able to keep track of what's going on. And, and, and many people are bounded by you know, whether it has to be online or not and how much space they have available. Up to you which one you're going to use. Choosing when to rebuild versus defrag, there's a bunch of numbers that you'll have seen uh, in books online and, and banded around the internet, and these were numbers that I came up with. I made these numbers up when I was at Microsoft because people needed some guidance of what to do. Now, I didn't just pull numbers out of thin air. I, I talked to customers. I talked to the customer advisory team. I did some experimentation, and these were the numbers that I came up with. If you have a small amount of fragmentation, so less than 5%, 10%, don't do anything. If you've got a reasonable amount of fragmentation, then just do a reorganize. If you have a heavy amount of fragmentation, do a rebuild. And so you'll see these numbers in books online. They use 5% in books online. And you'll see these numbers in um, maintenance plan wizard. You'll see them in, in all kinds of people's third party tools and, and so on. Your mileage is going to vary, but you might find that these numbers work perfectly well for you and that you just put these numbers in production and that's what you use. Now, my method of removing fragmentation, if you desperately want to pay me to do this for you, and some people have, um, I would much rather that you use somebody else's code to do it because there is, there's quite a few people have put out code to be able to do index maintenance. And, and for me, the gold standard is still Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution that does index maintenance, statistics maintenance, backups, and consistency checks. I know other people have put, put stuff out there as well, but Ola's is the one that I, I recommend and, and many people use. But if you desperately want to pay me to do it, this is what I will do. I will look at your, your indexes and figure out which ones actually have fragmentation problems that affect your workload performance. And I'll have a table that has a list of what those indexes are, and I call that the driver table. So when running the index physical stats DMV, I'm only going to run it on the indexes that are in the driver table. There's no point running it on everything because there's only a small number of indexes that I actually care about. And then in that driver table, I'll have thresholds for when to do nothing, when to rebuild, and when to reorganize. And it will keep a log of what it does from day to day or however often it runs. 
And one optional thing that I do is I will keep a track and see if if every time it it runs for say five times in a row it rebuilds a certain index, I'll drop that index's fill factor by five percent to see if I can stop it having to rebuild. And that's what I recommend as a, a, a nice way of being able to drive index maintenance. But as I said, I'd much rather that you go and use somebody like Ola's code, or at least take Ola's code and then modify it to do what you want, rather than just trying to write the code yourself. So uh, a couple of extra things just to finish off. How do online index operations work under the covers? So you've got an index and you want to rebuild it online. So the first thing that's going to happen is the online index operation is going to take a share table lock. Now that share table lock can be blocked. Now many people say online index operations don't cause blocking. Well, the marketing team didn't want to call the feature almost online index operations because that doesn't have quite as good a ring to it as online index operations. But they're really almost online because they do take a couple of locks that could cause blocking. And this is the first one. So while anybody is still modifying the table, this table share lock can't be held. And while the table share lock is waiting in the queue, nobody else can go and modify anything. So up until 2014, you just have to wait, essentially. 2014 has a new thing where the, the online index operation can do what's called waiting at low priority. In other words, that lock is in there in the pending queue for, for locks on the table, but it doesn't block anybody else from going and doing stuff. It's, it's basically a low priority lock. Eventually, we'll get the, the share lock on the table, and we can start building the new index. So it creates an empty index, and then it's going to recompile the query plans that are touching that index so that when any, whenever a change happens that's going to affect the index, it happens in the original index and in the new index as well. And then it kicks off a, a versioning scan. It doesn't turn on versioning under the covers. It doesn't turn on snapshot isolation, but it's using the versioning mechanism to just do a point in time scan of that old index. So all those things happen while that share lock is held, and then the share lock is essentially downgraded to an intent share lock, which is a, a very, very non-blocking lock. So the contents of the original index are transferred, or copied, I should say, over into the new index. Any changes that are made to the original index are made to the new index as well. And then at the end of the, 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 the long version scan, we should have the original index and the new index in, in lockstep. They should have exactly the same contents, but hopefully the new index is less fragmented. Now at that point, a schema modification lock has to be held. And the schema modification lock is a super exclusive lock, which means nobody can be doing anything with the table at all. And again, if you're on 2014, you can do this wait at low priority. So the, when the schema modification lock is held, essentially it's going to get rid of the old index. It swaps the, the allocations for the new index and the old index, and we've got a new completely rebuilt index. And that's how online index operations work under the covers. They're pretty cool. So uh, a quick demo to end things off, just to look at different ways of removing fragmentation. Very simple demo here. So if we look at our fragmentation again, we've got 99% fragmentation on our clustered index with the GUID. So let's go ahead and remove that. Now, depending on which version you are on, this may or may not work. If you're on 2012 or 2014, this will work. Okay, I'm doing an online index rebuild of the clustered index. And if you're on 2005 through 2008 R2, it will fail. And say, you can't do an online index operation because you have a lob column in the table. And the lob column in the table is, there's a one byte varchar max that I put in there. Right? And that will stop online index operations on that clustered index for 2005 through 2008 R2. So that in itself could be a good reason to, to move to 2012 or higher. So on 2008, 2008 R2 or before, you're going to have to do an offline rebuild. Now, if we look at the how the fragmentation changed, 99.17% dropped down to 0.1%. Okay? And there it's changed our fill factor to be 70%. Now, what about our non-clustered index, 27.7%? So let's do a reorganize on that. and our fragmentation goes down to 2%. Okay. Now, with a reorganize, you can't set the fill factor. Okay. That was an oversight 
when I wrote the original DBCC index defrag and then change it to, to reorganize. You can only set the fill factor when the index is created or rebuilt or using Management Studio in the index properties, you can go and set the fill factor. So if I wanted to set the fill factor, I'd have to go into Management Studio, or I could just do a, oops, I could just do a, an index rebuild. Okay, so I can try doing an online index rebuild and set the fill factor to 70. And then if we look, we'll see we went from 1.92%. We dropped down a little tiny bit. Now sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll be able to get a tiny bit more fragmentation removed by doing a rebuild versus a reorganize, but a reorganize is always going to get you to low single digit percentage. Okay, and there you can see we, we put our page density, uh, sorry, we put our fill factor in for the, the index using our rebuild. So it's hard to do a, a really cool demo around rebuilding indexes because it's just rebuilding indexes, but there you can see just a few things to, 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 to make note of. So the last few slides. Um, one other thing to think about is, are your indexes actually being used? You might have a whole bunch of non-clustered indexes that aren't actually being used. Now, anytime you've got non-clustered indexes that aren't being used, they are pure overhead. Okay? They're, that means that whenever you do an insert, update, or delete, that's going to have to happen on all your non-clustered indexes. So log records are going to be generated. And it's probably going to be the fact that those non-clustered indexes are going to be getting fragmented. And then your defragmentation is going to pick up those indexes and rebuild them or reorganize them. So you're, you're maintaining them as part of regular DML and you're maintaining them as part of your index maintenance. And if they're not being used for your workload, that's a lot of extra work being done for nothing at all. So use this DMV, DB index usage stats, and you'll be able to tell whether indexes are being used or not. So if you just go to, to Google or Bing and, and look for me or Kimberly, and lots of other people have blogged about this as well, and that name of that DMV, you'll get some idea about how to use that DMV to tell whether your indexes are being used and whether they're candidates for being dropped. Right. So to summarize then, preventing fragmentation. Okay, so fragmentation is always going to happen. You can't you can't get away from fragmentation, but what you can do is you can try to mitigate it. Right. Mitigating it using fill factors or trying to use index keys that aren't going to lead to page splits. That's, it's almost impossible to do that for non-clustered indexes. You can do it for a clustered index, but just remember what I said about the insert hotspot problem. Now, one other thing, just to reiterate again, is if people say you're using solid state disks, you don't have to care about fragmentation. They are absolutely wrong. Okay? You have to care about fragmentation no matter what your storage subsystem is using. You don't want to have a bunch of wasted space. You don't want to have all those log records being generated by page splits occurring because you're not caring about fragmentation. Solid state disks don't do anything to stop that. So you always have to care about fragmentation. And hopefully with what you've learned in this, this little session here, you'll have a good idea about fragmentation and what you can do about it. Now some resources, there is my blog. I've talked about fragmentation quite a bit on my blog. There's actually a Pluralsight course that I just recorded, and it just, just, just so happened that we're doing this just after the Pluralsight course got released. There's a two and a half hour Pluralsight course about index fragmentation, where it goes into an awful lot more depth than you've just seen here. And if you're interested in, in looking at that, shoot me a, a, an email and you can get that uh, free Pluralsight code if you don't already have Pluralsight. A link again to Ola's maintenance scripts. As I said, other people have done stuff around this as well, but I still think Ola's is, are the gold standard. There's a white paper that talks about this. It's very, very old though. It's from, from 2000, unfortunately. They've never updated the white paper that talks about fragmentation. Now, the old 2000 white paper does talk about the concepts of fragmentation, but it talks about the old DBCC commands. Right? And then if you're an insomniac, there is a white paper that goes into a huge amount of depth about how online index operations work in uh, 2005 and, and onwards as well. So with that, we are done with the the presentation, and I'll hang around and do questions for however long people have questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, You're welcome. I'm going to hit a few questions here, but I, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, we've had a big debate where I work and about setting the fill factor. In our transactional systems, we set it to 80% on the instance level. And okay. some people say, oh, no, 0%, you know, 100, you know? Yep. yep. And um, we go back and forth, and we've had all these discussions. And I hate to put you on the spot, but I mean, do you have recommendations or anything? Yep. I think you mentioned something, but I'm not sure. No, absolutely. So in general, what I recommend is not setting it at the instance level and leaving it set to 0, 100. They're both the same. Because 
in, in many scenarios, you'll find that people will set the fill factor at the instance level, and then they'll go ahead and rebuild all the indexes all the time, and there'll be a, a bunch of indexes that don't have any fragmentation issues ever because they don't have random key inserts and they don't have update issues. And so for those indexes that don't have any fragmentation issues, if you set the fill factor to 80%, that 20% that you're putting on every leaf level page of empty space is truly wasted. It's never going to be used for the purpose that it's there for. So if you have a system where you know that every one of your indexes has a fragmentation issue and having a fill factor set is a good thing, then you can set the instance-wide fill factor to whatever you want, okay? If you have that situation, but I, uh, for what I've seen, most people don't have that situation. So they are going to end up with some indexes that have wasted space. Now, what you could do is you could set your instance fill factor, know that there are some indexes that don't have any fragmentation issues, and go and set those indexes specifically to have a fill factor of 100. Okay. Okay. So, so what you're doing is is you're taking taking the you have to you have to basically know which indexes you care about, and either you go and set the fill factor for just those indexes, or you set the fill factor for everything, and then go and set the fill factor for those indexes you don't care about. And in my mind, it's, and from dealing with with lots of clients, it's easier for people to not set the fill factor for everything and only set the fill factor for those indexes that are a problem. That makes sense? Oh, yeah. That helps a lot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I know some of my colleagues are watching, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll come to a consensus, you know? Right. Yep. It, it, we, we seem to argue a lot about this point. Yeah. Th I mean, there's no, there's, no, there's no right way of doing it. It's like anything with SQL Server. There's no, there's no absolute, always correct answer. So, I mean, what I'm saying is, is just a recommendation. But as long as you make sure that the, for those indexes that don't have fragmentation problems, whichever way you go about setting it, there's no fill factor for those indexes. That's the right way to do it. I got you. And, and so the, then the, re, the rebuild job doesn't pick them up because the fragmentation never gets, you know, there's no issue. I got exactly. you. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Off. That was actually for me, so thank you. Um, <laughs> let's see. So we have a few questions, and I'll, I'm going to try and get them. I think some of these you've answered. So if, you know, if I skipped your question, I'm going to make sure I get an email to Paul with everything um, because there's quite a few here. Um so I'm gonna start right here, and it's basically asking for a script, a script to estimate the wasted space on a heap table. Um, the wasted space on a heap table. Yeah, I. I so don't. that's I think what the person's wanting is uh, a way to to figure out how much space has been taken up extra because you've got forwarding records in your your heaps, and you can. You can basically use the, the same script, index physical stats, because for a, when you run it on a heap, what it's going to do is it'll give you the page density just as it would for a clustered index. So you could do exactly that thing and then correlate that with the number of, of forwarding pointers you have. And if you find that you've got a lot of wasted space and lots of forwarding pointers in a heap, then the solution for that is create a clustered index and just leave the clustered index there so that you're not having to do forwarding pointers. Because on, on average, a uh, heap with lots of forwarding pointers that's getting used for lots of key lookups is going to be less efficient than a uh, clustered index. Okay. So that's that's a huge can of worms that I'm not going to get into. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's a well, – I'm going to read it. Just read it the way it is. What is the effect of running a shrink before or after a reorg index? Well, a shrink is going to cause fragmentation because of the way that the shrink works. So – um, if you if you absolutely have to reclaim space in your data files, then there, there's two ways of doing it. There's you can run a shrink, and that will do it, but that will cause fragmentation. So then you have to remove the fragmentation afterwards, and using a reorganize, don't use a rebuild because that's going to have to expand your data files to create the extra space required to do the rebuild. The other way of doing the shrink is to take all the indexes in the the area you want to shrink and do a create index with drop existing equals on for those indexes and then say on your new file group. Right? But I would definitely do not do a shrink after doing a any kind of index maintenance because you're just going to put the fragmentation back. Okay. Um, do stats and query plans need to be updated based on rebuilds versus reorgs? And I know you answered that, but go ahead. 
yes, if, you, if you're doing reorganizing, then it's not going to touch your indexed column statistics at all. And so you have to take that into account in your statistics maintenance. And I believe that, uh, that Ola's code will, will take that into account for you. Or, or you can do that yourself. But, but yes, a reorganized doesn't touch statistics at all is the easiest way to think about that. Okay. Here's one. Uh, do you have any recommendations for data warehouse situations to avoid page splits, fragmentations? Exactly what we just talked about. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what, what the, the underlying use of your database and your tables are. If you're finding that you've got fragmentation occurring, especially in a data warehouse where you might be you know, periodically updating the data and that's causing fragmentation issues, use a fill factor okay, just to, to make sure that you've got free space there to prevent the, the page splits from occurring. It's no different just because you're a data warehouse. Okay. If you have an index that has a fragmentation that will not clear when you drop and recreate it, uh, I don't maybe I misread that. If you have an index. Let me reread it. If you have an index that has a fragmentation that will not clear after you drop and recreate it, say 50% fragmentation with 5,000 pages. Uh, I'm trying to understand what they're saying. Hmm. I'm I'm not getting it. Oh, I think I think I am. So oh. if you if you have a if you have an index that you you rebuild and let's say you've got a Maybe you've got a 64-core server, and you don't specify max DO, and you've got you've got uh, max DOP set to zero on your instance. Then the index rebuild might parallelize into 64 threads, each building one 64th of your index. So you're going to have 64 separate portions of your index, and so you're going to have a whole bunch of index fragmentation immediately, just because you've got 64 separate portions of the index. Now. Um, if that's the problem that you have, try doing the max DOP option for your index rebuilds. If that's not the option that you have and and you want to, to send me some information on email, shoot me an email with a little bit more about what it is you're, you're talking about and I'll see if I can help you. Okay, here's one. I read about a hot fix and they're asking about this. Oh, oh, oh hold, on, hold on, hold on. One other thing. Um, if, if, if you're Measuring the fragmentation using um, DBCC show contig and you're using extent scan fragmentation, then that is documented as not working if your file group has more than one file. So if you're rebuilding your index and you're looking at extent fragmentation and you're seeing it at 50%, you're never ever going to be able to fix that, okay? Because the algorithm in DBCC show contig doesn't work, okay? So if that's your problem, stop looking at that, okay? And if it's if it's something else apart from the two things that I've just said, shoot me an email. Sorry, Rob. Oh no, that's fine. Um, let's see. Someone asked about a comment. Let's see. I, I, I got a lot of them just scanning through here. Uh, I lost it. Uh, sorry. Oh, they're asking. Here's one. Does this apply to spatial indexes? Spatial indexes. A spatial. I misread it. Um, yes, this can this can apply to spatial indexes as well. Let's see. Oh, they're asking about the. There was an issue with the re-indexing. Uh, have you heard about an index a problem with the re-indexing or oh, with the online re-indexing issue fix? Which issue? I mean, there's oh, been bugs. Sure. In, there's been there's been bugs in online index rebuild in uh, in all versions of SQL Server. So without anything more specific, okay. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But yeah, so I mean, if you're if you're seeing a if you're seeing a, a bug or a problem when you're using online index operations, then go to, go to a search to to see if you look for online index and uh, KB article and see if it comes up with a problem. And if you're still seeing a problem, contact product support. Okay. Okay. You've probably got you hit some kind of bug, and they'll be able to point you at whether the fix is. Okay. Well, I think we did pretty good. Uh, I, I'm we got a lot of questions and answers go answered in a. I want to thank you, Paul, for coming on today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And I'll, uh, for everyone, I'll bundle these up and uh, share them with Paul. And I'm sure uh, if I missed your question, uh, we'll, I mean, there were so many here flying here. I'm just trying to get most of them, and I'll make sure Paul gets them all. Thank no you. No worries. And uh, I think we set a record here. We had over 300 people online today. Oh, fantastic. I, I don't ever remember having that many people online. So thank everyone for joining our group and uh, watching the webinar. 
and we'll have it recorded and saved on the website. And I will send Paul the thank yous. I've seen lots of thank yous and information about, you know, it's a great webinar. So um, I'll share all that with Paul um, shortly after today. Um, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you, Paul. Do you, you want to share anything else? No, just thank you everybody for watching, and, and don't forget, if you have any questions about what we talked about, shoot me an email, and if you're interested in a uh, uh, trying out Plural site, again, shoot me an email, and I'll send you a code, and, and I guess thanks again, Rob, and, and thanks to Pass for hosting all these for the community. Oh, you're quite welcome. Well, everyone have a great day. We're going to end it here. Bye. Take care. Bye.